Well, congratulations. You have made it to the end of, of this course. And uh, you should feel, if, you, if you've done all the exercises and you've stuck with me all the way to the end here, you have a fairly complete foundation of OpenMP to build on. So really, congratulations. You, sh you should really be feeling pretty confident about yourself in terms of what you can do with OpenMP. I just want to close a little bit with some of the key design patterns that we've thought about. Now, let me, let, let me just take a slight diversion here to talk, to talk about this. Regardless of whether you use OpenMP or TBB or Silk, which are these other programming models that, that people make heavy use of and Intel is very heavily involved with, regardless of how you spell Parallel 4 or how you express creating a bunch of threads, there are certain algorithm concepts that are universal across programming models. These are the design patterns behind parallel programming. And the difference between a novice parallel programmer and an expert parallel programmer is the expert has in their head a collection of these fundamental design patterns. So when I teach at the university level parallel computing, what I focus on is the design patterns. And then I say, look, you got this pattern down. Let's look at it in this language, this language, this language, this language. OK, that's how you become an expert parallel programmer. And so I hope as you leave this series of discussions and you move on to grow as a parallel programmer, that you'll seek that out and start thinking and start looking at the patterns and seeing how you can express them in different programming languages. Let me, let me give you an idea. So we've talked a few times about the single program multiple data. This is a very common pattern. I create a collection of units of execution. For us, they've been threads. Um, and each one's going to run the same program. And they're going to do something a little bit different depending on their ID and the number of threads. All right, very common pattern. All right, this is used in almost every MPI. That's a message passing distributed memory notation. They're almost always using the single program multiple data. OpenMP, when you get to large scale parallel machines, uh, where they're very, very NUMA, very non uniform, make heavy, heavy use of this pattern. So this is a very, very common pattern. Single program multiple data. And you have a lot of experience with it because our early Pi programs, that's what they were using. Okay, so, and I just bring it up here as an example where, you know, you have a single parallel region. Every thread's going to go through all the code in that parallel region. And then we're going to split up the loop between them and off they go. Now, the other pattern that's very, very common in OpenMP is loop parallelism. And you know that already too, all right? You go through your program and you define the, the compute intensive loops. You modify those loops so the iterations can be done independently. And then you put a, a parallel for or for construct to say, do these loops in parallel. Very, very common technique. And, and for most people in OpenMP, this is what OpenMP is all about to them, is the, the loop parallelism pattern. All right, so very heavily used in OpenMP. All right, and this, of course, is where we've been exposed to this, was with our Pi program with loop level parallelism, where we went through, and of course, there's that one central loop, and I just went, you know, pragma OMP parallel four, and then I had the private X, and then the reduction, and that was all it took to parallelize this program. But yeah, I think you can see how this would project onto a larger program, where you might have, you know, several blocks of loops which you go through, and you just apply this pattern again and again. Where's the loop? Compute intensive loop, let me find it, parallelize that, find the next loop. So that's the loop parallelism pattern. Now, divide and conquer, I touched on this briefly. But when you start looking at programming models that are built around tasks, like the tasks, like the tasks in OpenMP, or like the, the, the spawn statements in Silk. So there, this shows up in other places as well. Uh, TBB has a task notation as well. So this comes up a lot. So, the divide and conquer pattern occurs when you have a method that divides, divides into subproblems. And you go through and you recursively build up these subproblems to get this big tree of subproblems that you then recombine to build a global solution. So you need to have a split operation. You need to have a continue operation to, to, to create the subproblems until you're done, until they're small enough to solve directly. Then you solve them directly, and you recombine up that tree to get a final answer. OK, let me show you. So this is a picture of the divide and conquer problem. So you've got the original problem. You've got some way to split it into smaller subproblems. 
You keep doing that till they get so small you can solve them directly. Then you recombine them level by level by level until you get your final answer back. Let's take a moment and look at this. So here we have my OpenMP program for pi, and it uses the divide and conquer pattern. All right, so let's, let's look at the main program first, which is the blue box, all right? All it's gonna do is pragma OMP parallel, create a bunch of threads, and then one thread is gonna call sum equals pi compute, all right? So one thread's gonna call that off. And that's important, because remember, I want one thread to start it, then we're gonna sort of create this tree, do the compute, and then put it back together again. So now let's go inside the pi compute function. All right, so now, and this is the standard procedure in a divide and conquer. First thing it's gonna do is it's gonna test. Is my problem small enough to compute it directly? So there I have the, you know, if n finish minus n start is small enough below my minimum size, just do the computation and be done. Otherwise, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do split it. So I'm gonna pick a split parameter. Then I'm gonna have one task do the low bound, another task do the high bound, and then I'll do a task wait to wait to put them back together again. All right, this should all look very familiar. So now I'm gonna to continue to do that, call it recursively. So the, the tree is gonna span out until everyone down at the leaves are small enough to compute directly. Then I'm gonna work up through all those task weights to work up to the final global solution. Very powerful method. So it's the divide and conquer pattern and it's used quite a bit, especially when you have Oh, problems with recursive parallelism, problems where you can't necessarily deterministically know how to split it up. So these are just three of the patterns that are very common in OpenMP. And you can see that I, I can use them all on the same problem. So the SPMD with the critical section, we went from 1.87 down to 1, down to 0.88. With the loop, we went from 1.91 down to 1.02, down to 0.8. And then you can see with the tasks. 1.87, down to 1, down to 0.76, uh, down ultimately to 0.52. So you can see the, the, the efficiency from that task-oriented one was actually pretty darn high. So the, the point of this, though, was really to give you an idea as we tried to wrap up everything we've talked about, that one programming language, OpenMP, but three radically different ways to approach algorithms. One SPMD, one let's focus on the loops, one, let's focus on these recursive subdivisions, this divide and conquer into all these tasks. And OpenMP is general enough to support you in all three. So, and there, there's even some more patterns, but as I said, I want you to start getting the concept that there's these recurring patterns. So as you continue to learn and look at other programming models, you can start to recognize that, oh, that's, that's just the divide and conquer pattern. Oh, this is easy, I know that already. So it'll really help you move more quickly through your education into the expertise of parallel programming. All right, now, where do you go to learn more? So OpenMP is owned, managed, further developed through a group called the OpenMP Architecture Review Board. So you, you need just one URL to remember, www.openmp.org. You can download the specs, you can download tutorials, you can learn about resources to help you, it's great. Then there's a users group for OpenMP, and they have an annual workshop that is great to attend if you want to learn more about OpenMP and actually mix with people working at the, the forefront of this language. You can learn about that at the user group, which is called CompUnity. So it's www.compunity.org. So, you know, look, get involved and help move OpenMP forward. OpenMP continually evolves and is growing and becoming more and more powerful and effective. There's some good books on OpenMP. The classic book focused just on OpenMP is called Using OpenMP. It's by my good friend uh, Barbara Chapman and, and uh, some colleagues that worked with her. Um, then there's a book that is absolutely marvelous in my purely objective opinion called Patterns for Parallel Programming. Yeah, it's my book, you know. I'm doing all this talking, I should be able to push my own book, right? <laughs> but it's an entire book that focuses on the fundamental patterns of parallel programming. And what I like about it is it introduces the pattern and then it discusses it in OpenMP, MPI, and Java. So you can see the same pattern in three completely different programming notations as you move forward. And frankly, that's the valuable way to really learn parallel algorithms is when you start to see how the same algorithm appears in different programming languages. A more computer science-y book for those of you who are quite interested in the, the nature of languages, how languages evolve and change over time, 
is called Concurrency in Programming Languages. And this charts out the history of programming languages where concurrency appeared, and it looks at how they appeared across OpenMP, but the predecessors of OpenMP, it goes into Silk, it goes into uh, Erlang, it covers a number of modern languages and how concurrencies appeared in these languages over time. And then the last book I want to talk to you about is an excellent book by a good friend of mine, Clay Brashears, here at Intel, called The Art of Concurrency. So when you start looking at things like the details of flush and pairwise uh, synchronization and all those different flavors of atomics and how you use those in really complex applications where you have to look at the concurrent interaction between units of execution and how to manage those in a programming notation, that's the book for you. So these are some books you can look at to learn more about OpenMP and parallel programming in general and move further in your skills as a parallel programmer. This is a dynamic community. It is growing and expanding. Uh, gosh, OpenMP 4.0 is about to come out and it'll have all sorts of new functionality. There is a lot happening. So um, don't view this as a static, you know, a snapshot of OpenMP, you're done, oh, now you can just go off. No. Get involved. Get involved with the community. Follow what's going on. OpenMP is evolving as hardware is evolving. And, and, and not only that, there, you know, there's a lot happening in parallel computing in general, even beyond OpenMP. So really, I hope this gets you started on what will be an ongoing education for you in parallel computing.